just would like people in the audience at this time, if they have a cell phone or a pager, if they could silence those as a courtesy to our speaker for today. The topic is civil war, bounties, bonds, banknotes, and taxes. Our speaker is Dr. Preston Pierce. And Preston Pierce, may you please proceed. Okay, and I'm going to follow that good advice and make sure the sound is off on my own cell phone. <laughs> I've made that announcement to classes at FLCC, and a week later, my own phone goes on. Uh, so, uh, you know, do as I say, not as I do doesn't go over very well, especially with young people. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, am here today in my capacity as the regional archivist of the Rochester Regional Library Council over in Fairport. I live in Canandaigua, and uh, I've, I've worn a number of hats over time. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just mention one of the others. Since 1983, I have also been the Ontario County Historian. So I work for the Department of Records and Archives for Ontario County on a part-time basis. And what I have been, except for a soldier all of my adult life, is uh, a teacher of history at one level or another. Uh, done all the secondary grades and uh, now I uh, also teach U.S. history at Finger Lakes Community College, hence the comment about the cell phone. But it's my pleasure to be here today, and in my capacity as the regional archivist, what I'm really here to do is uh, several things. Uh, first of all, I hope you find this entertaining. The Civil War is always a, uh, a topic that people have a lot of interest in. However, today, this isn't really a Civil War story about drums and guns and marching to Gettysburg. Uh, this is the story of what made that possible. Certainly the local men and the women who supported them in various organizations uh, made the Union victory in the Civil War possible. Uh, it was determination. It was the larger size of the population on the Union side. Uh, you know, a lot of things made it possible, but one of the elements that tied it all together and something that we often forget about is the fact that the, the Union had a better financial system. Uh, there's a certain amount of any conflict or any enterprise that comes down to business and one of the distinct advantages that the Union had at the beginning and developed uh, throughout the, the conflict was the advantage of uh, a better financial system uh, and a better monetary system. And the, the two of those, I'm, I'm no economist, but I, uh, if, if you're uh, in banking or finance, you probably know the, the difference between those two things. They're cousins, related, but not the same. It is the Civil War that gave us a number of things that we're very familiar with. It gave us Memorial Day used to be called Decoration Day. It uh, gave us monuments and cemeteries and town squares. It gave us local histories. It was during the Civil War uh, that the Medal of Honor was uh, instituted and began the so-called Pyramid of Honor that's used by the armed forces today to honor people for distinguished conduct and meritorious service. But there are other things the Civil War gave us. Uh, this is the... Uh, opposite time of year when we normally think of this, but we have the Civil War to, think, uh, to thank for the existence of the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, it is the Civil War that gave the United States its first graduated income tax. Uh, it is uh, the Civil War that introduced the concept of paper money. Uh, and in particular, uh, I don't know if I've got any loose here, but in particular the kind of paper money that is exclusively our paper money today, which we accept without thinking because of some wording that's uh, on, on the $1 bill up here in the upper left corner in very fine print, but it's very meaningful to us. It says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, but nowhere on this note does it say that it's actually worth anything in terms of silver and gold. We accept it because we have to accept it, because everybody else accepts it, because the government accepts it, and because we have no choice. And that concept uh, of expanding the money supply through the use of paper money 
or banknotes as they were more commonly known then, uh, is also something that was introduced to the United States because of the Civil War. So without going any further into this, let me uh, just uh, begin the program. And I, I have to give you one caveat. Uh, a week and a half ago, I had some eye surgery. I am the proverbial guy that's sort of blind in one eye and sort of sees out of the other one. So are we all in focus? Little, little audience participation here? We're in focus, good. Roscoe Conkling was one of the most influential members of Congress at the time of the outbreak of the Civil War. This is what he had to say about finance. War is not a question of valor, but a question of money. It is not regulated by the laws of honor, but by the laws of trade. The practical problem to be solved in crushing the rebellion of despotism against representative government is who can throw the most projectiles, who can afford the most iron and lead. To get it down to something a little more simple, President Lincoln himself, after the Battle of Antietam, says, give the money machine another crank. We've got to find the money. We cannot allow this war to fail. In Lincoln's understanding, money was as important as personnel or uh, creativity or uh, geographic advantages in winning the war. Money for a conflict like the Civil War was in fact needed for a variety of things, for munitions, weapons, transportation, the sustenance of troops, the pay of troops, and uh, the pay of others, civilian employees that went along with the troops. Uh, you may be familiar with a, one of the uh, great women in Civil War history from upstate New York, Dr. Mary Walker from the Oswego area. Uh, who was the only woman still on the Medal of Honor list, uh, having received it during the Civil War, but she was a contract surgeon. She wasn't actually in the Army, which made her medal somewhat controversial, and at one point it was taken from her and then restored in later years. But you can see there a federal wagon train moving supplies into Petersburg, Virginia, in uh, the final months of the war. And obviously, somebody has to pay for that, to pay for the people driving the wagons, for the contents of the wagons, for the wagons themselves. And then, finally, for the impact of the war on our nation later on. The Union had a number of advantages in prosecuting the Civil War, uh, at least financial advantages. 31 million people, none of whom were in chattel slavery. Uh, it's very difficult to get slaves to do what you want them to do. They'll always find some way to resist, at least passively. And if you hold people in slavery, you have to hold other people to guard the people who are in slavery. People who are enslaved and unhappy, uh, given the opportunity, disappear. And so consequently, slavery was a double whammy on the population of the South. Uh, in the South, New Orleans, uh, the only city in the South with a population exceeding 100,000 people. Not Charleston, not Richmond, not Montgomery, none of the other significant uh, cities of the South. The Union had excellent harbors, you know, and I'm sure you know them, Salem, Boston, Providence, New York, Philadelphia, uh, and, and other places, uh, not to mention uh, the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River, all forming a good transportation network that got better throughout the war, especially after the United States Military Railroad was created, basically took over the railroad operations of the country during the war. Rapid industrialization was already taking place and would continue in the North after the war. Uh, Pennsylvania and New York, two of the biggest of the Union states remaining in the Union during the war, together produced uh, twice as much in terms of its uh, gross annual product than the entire Confederacy did. So the, the Union's got some very distinct advantages. Two additional Union advantages had to do with financial centers. Uh, and that, that, of course, can work to your advantage or disadvantage. Uh, we all know that, that when... Uh, uh, Middle Eastern terrorists decided to attack the United States in 2001, 
Uh, you know, they picked a military target like the Pentagon. Uh, they picked probably another civilian target. We're not sure what because the one plane crashed in Pennsylvania. But they, the one part of that attack that we remember the most because it was most devastating was the attack on the World Trade Center. Of all the symbolic things those people could have attacked, they passed right over the Statue of Liberty. They passed right over the United Nations building, didn't attack any of those places. They went for the financial heart of uh, the operation there. So uh, we had uh, great financial centers. We had financial experience in, in banking. Most of that was located in the North. The North had a deep tax base. And it had the vast majority of the nation's money supply. There was a United States Mint in New Orleans that was briefly in the, in the heart of the Confederacy. Uh, there was a United States Mint in Philadelphia. And I believe the U.S. Mint in Denver, Colorado was uh, in production and in Carson City, Nevada. So there, uh, there was a, the production, the actual production of money hard money at the start of the war, was primarily in the North. That meant that as the Civil War begins, the Union and the Confederacy are going to have two divergent uh, avenues toward raising the money they need to prose prosecute the war. On the Union side, they are uh, going to finance about 66% of the operation based on loans, and the loans are primarily the selling of bonds. But as you're going to see, the bonds aren't all what we usually think of bonds as being. About 21% of the cost to the Union is going to be raised by taxes. The Confederacy uh, is not going to be able to raise much in taxes because their tax base is going to diminish. Much of the war destroyed their tax base because it was an agriculturally based economy and you can't have 20, 30,000 men fight to the death for three days at harvest time at a place like Antietam and not destroy an awful lot of the farmland there and in other places. Uh, both sides tried to expand the money supply. It was unsuccessful for the Confederacy because of the growing lack of trust. Remember when I showed you the $1 bill, I mentioned to you, and you think about it, one of the reasons we accept our paper money is because we trust. Uh, what else is there? You want to hold out and say, no, I don't want that. I'll just take Canadian money or some, something else. Um, you know, around here, you could get away with that to a limited extent, but I always remind students, I have a... a quite a vivid memory a long way back in the 1980s of taking my family to Disney World. And uh, we were from Canandaigua, and my wife had a few, as, as probably most people here do, a few Canadian coins in her purse. We thought nothing of them. She went to buy something, uh, and when she gave one of the, the uh, not really a, sales clerk, but uh, you know, one, of the, one of the vendors down there at Disney World, she, without thinking, inadvertently gave her a Canadian nickel. They called security on her. Right? Because Canada to them is just another foreign country in the Western Hemisphere. It's not the next door neighbor that generates a lot of our tourist industry. So it, it, uh, they're a little more conscious and less trusting. Trust is important with money. Both sides tried then to expand the money supply, and both sides had a heavy reliance on local support. Uh, I'll show you something a little bit later, some documents from Ontario County. I haven't checked too much in Monroe County, but I have no reason to believe the story is any different. If you go back and you look at the, uh, the town books for the towns in Monroe County, I'm willing to bet that you'll find the very same thing you find in the rural counties around here. Uh, and that is that the money that was raised by the townships to support soldiers' families and to encourage enlistment in the Union Army amounted to more money than all the money they spent on every other activity that the town was engaged in during the war years. Huge amounts of money. Unlike today, you know, we have a war in Afghanistan, we just assume the national government's going to pay the cost of that one way or another. 
Civil War, a lot more of it was bottom up, and a lot of the cost of the war was borne by states and local municipalities. The Confederacy uh, floated a lot of loans. Uh, there's a, a typical Confederate bond. Uh, this is one of the actual things, and I'll pass this around. You can take a look at it. Uh, at the end of the war, of course, uh, those were worthless. And there is actually a provision now in the U.S. Constitution that makes them worthless forever. This is uh, a graph. We won't stay with this too awfully long here, but it gives you an idea of uh, the relative comparison of Union and Confederate uh, sources of revenue uh, during the war years and, and how they went up. I mentioned the fact that uh, the financial situation of the South got weaker as the war progressed, and of course one of the reasons for that is the South was the seat of war, as they said. Uh, when This is Richmond. When you uh, have one of your financial centers, one of the few that you've got, devastated by the war, uh, it's very difficult to use that center and the people who used to live there to think creatively uh, and think financially and to raise the money for the war. This is a typical Stereoptican card produced, I think this was done shortly after the war, but it is a, a, a Brady photograph during the war of the so-called sunken road at the Battle of Antietam. By 1862, the Civil War was no longer thought of as a, a patriotic parade with flags flying and bright uniforms like the Zouave troops that both sides fielded during the war. Uh, it was a, a down in the mud, by the throat, drag them out, dirty experience and a fight to the death. Uh, that had a, a number of effects on both sides in the Civil War. For the North, it was a motivator to some extent. It was also a problem because after 1862, uh, it was no longer easy to give a patriotic speech and expect that a large number of the young men from any particular town were going to get up and volunteer to go off to war. So it's in 1862 that a new cost of the war arises, especially in the North, and that cost is going to be the bounties that it's necessary to pay to convince young men to go and join the war effort. One of the other things that the Union did was to raise import taxes. Uh, there are, there are cer certain issues, just a handful of issues, that uh, are the political issues that go way back beyond the creation of the United States uh, under the Constitution. And import taxes is one of them. Back to the colonial era, to the 1760s and before, uh, one of the causes of the American Revolution, ultimately, was the uh, objection to, of the population to certain import taxes, to how they were collected, and for what they were used. We still do it, however, and new import taxes were uh, laid during the Civil War. The, the issue more is what gets taxed and who, get, who gets to determine how the tax money is going to be used. In 1862, Congress passed the Morrill Act. That's uh, Justin Morrill, who was uh, the lone congressman from Vermont. Vermont's population is and was so low that they only have one member of the House of Representatives. He happened to be the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, and so he introduced the, the uh, Act of uh, the Tariff Act of 1862, and two years later, uh, he introduced a higher tariff law. Uh, the customs duties, however, only produced about $75 million a year. So while that is contributing to the benefit of the union, uh, it's not going to pay all the bills. It's also something that the, the Confederacy could not do because by 1862, the U.S. Navy was blockading the South. So it was virtually impossible for the South to import uh, enough to have uh, a real uh, economy based on that. The next step in financing the war for the Union was to start issuing paper money uh, to replace the hoarded money, the silver and gold. Uh, you hear a lot these days about getting back to what the founding fathers wanted to do. We need to 
you know, to uh, go back to the ideas in the Constitution that were established by the founding fathers. Uh, I, perhaps it displays a, uh, an editorial slant on my part, but uh, anybody who thinks that needs to think real carefully about which parts of the Constitution you want to go back to that the founding fathers gave us. Uh, if you decide that you don't want to do anything that's not in the Constitution, which was Thomas Jefferson's point of view, it's, it's an old point of view, uh, then you better get rid of the Air Force because the Constitution says that Congress can have an army and a navy, period. Uh, but of more, uh, more direct impact, uh, the Constitution also says that only gold and silver will be legal tender in the United States. And that means, uh, in effect, that the penny and the nickel uh, and, of course, all of our paper money would be unconstitutional. And that was uh, a matter of some legal wrangling and a number of court cases in the late 19th century. But the fact was that there was a lot of silver and uh, a lot of gold coins out there. And the minute hard times struck, in this case the restrictions of war, people began to hoard that, put it in a tin box and put it in the cellar, put it in the back lawn, put it any number of places. Generally, not so much in banks because banks had a long history of being untrustworthy in the 19th century. Uh, the issuance of paper money that would be guaranteed by the Union government also tied people's loyalty to the government. You know, to a certain extent, uh, if you have uh, a piece of paper money and uh, it says that it's legal tender for all debts, public and private, a public debt is taxes, so the government stands behind this. Uh, if the government stands behind it, then you stand behind the government because without the government, your money's not worth anything. And that gets right to the heart of our wallets. So tying, you know, it's and uh, today's Sunday, so if you'll pardon it, you can even get biblical about it. You know, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Uh, you know, the, uh, where your money is, is where your loyalty will be. And the people in, in charge of the Union government knew that. But there was that provision in the Constitution. The question was, how do you work around that creatively, as it turns out? In 1861, $60 million in greenbacks, in so-called demand notes, were issued by the U.S. government. That inflates the money supply, gives more cash out there to change hands, keep the economy going, and pay all those soldiers that you're getting in the Union Army. Not made legal tender uh, for about eight months after its issue. Uh, but made legal tender to tie people's loyalty more closely to it. Equal to coin, accepted for customs duties and excise taxes and other things, but no specie backing. It was simply backed by faith in the government. You don't have faith, you don't have a choice. Uh, and the, the uh, head of the Treasury and uh, the Lincoln administration knew that. Remember I said uh, there were bonds that, that didn't look like the bonds you normally see? Uh, the next issue in paper money turned out to be a bond by another uh, form, and that was the compound interest treasury notes. If, I'm sure a lot of you know about T-bills and the rest of those things, but those are the paper evidence of your having an investment with the U.S. Treasury is just something you put in a safe deposit box or wherever else it is that you put your uh, important papers. These bonds were bonds that were the same size and shape as other paper money. So you'd carry them around and you could spend them. And You can't read it very well, but right here on the back was a, a table of the uh, increased value that these notes would have over time. They, they were, in effect, U.S. savings bonds, and they were passed as currency. Uh, in the economy. They had detachable coupons uh, for redemption of six-month intervals, and uh, you can see they were paying between 5 and 7 percent a year, which today would be pretty good, uh, and was very good in the 1860s. Legal tender notes, 
also called United States notes, began to be issued in 1862. They also have no specie backing, meaning there's no gold or silver that you can get for them. Uh, exchangeable for 20-year bonds at 6%, uh, and like the others, all having a green back. Uh, all of these things are being issued to get around various quirks in the law and that requirement in the Constitution that legal tender uh, be uh, gold and silver. So that, that's why uh, they're, they're very careful about this. And, and finally, Congress passes legislation that is eventually challenged after the war, making these legal tender. Another way of expanding the money supply was small change. Uh, because of that provision in the Constitution that only gold and silver be legal tender, there were uh, a, a limited uh, number of coins that were available to the public at the outbreak of the Civil War. So there was a three cent piece made out of silver, about half the size of a modern dime. There was the 10 cent piece, or the dime. There was the quarter, there was the half dollar, and there was the silver dollar, and then there were gold, $5 gold pieces, $10, $20 gold pieces, uh, and I, for part of the time there was a $2.5 gold piece, uh, but I believe that comes along after the war. During the war, a number of new coins are uh, introduced. Uh, there's a, 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 a nickel, a five cent piece uh, that's not silver that's introduced, a two cent piece that is almost the size of the old large cent uh, pennies in, in the United States economy were about the size of quarters until the 1850s. And then in the mid-1850s, the size of the penny was reduced to about what it is today. It was a little bit thicker, but it, about the size of the penny today. And it's been small uh, ever since. I, I believe it was 1857 when they reduced the size of the penny. But this new two cent piece that came out uh, was designed to deal with inflation because things are costing more uh, and, and designed to deal with the need for small change. And then the three cent piece was changed from silver, which was being hoarded and they didn't have enough of it, to uh, a, a, a copper nickel combination. So you can see there uh, the uh, uh, three cent piece that replaced the original silver three cent piece. That didn't entirely solve the economic problem in the North of not having enough change, however. And so two other things began to happen. One was that individual communities and stores and banks began to issue their own change, sometimes very creatively. Uh, and uh, you got store tokens like the ones that are there. Uh, and at the same time, the United States government began to issue paper money in very small denominations. This is a uh, U.S. government issued paper bill, Civil War issue, for 15 cents. So you can take that around and take a look at it. They got The smallest ones were uh, the five cent bills. I don't believe I have a five cent bill here that you can take a look at. Uh, I think the smallest I have. No, I take that back. Here's one of the five cent fractional notes, as they call them. They're not legal tender, but they can be exchanged for paper money in larger denominations that eventually was made legal tender, and they can be taken to the post office, and they can be used for the uh, purchase of stamps. Local scrip was issued, and you can see here uh, in the top right, uh, the Farmers and Mechanics Bank of Rochester, New York, in the top right. Uh, and in the, excuse me, top left. And top right is the uh, Monroe County Bank. Uh, this is the bottom right is the Farmers and Manufacturers Bank of Poughkeepsie. Bottom left is the Bank of Geneva down in Ontario County. And that's a 10 cent note from the, the city of Troy. Not from any particular bank, but the city of Troy itself, great industrial center at the time. State and private issued money is a problem for the union. First of all, they can't control the amount of it that's being issued and the amount of money in circulation 
has an impact on inflation and deflation, and that in turn has an impact on tax collection. So uh, that's one reason the U.S. government uh, had for deciding during the Civil War to take steps to eliminate the issue of uh, private money in the United States. There had been paper money in the first half of the 19th century, but none of it issued by governments. There was paper money that was issued by local community banks, but there was no regulation of the banks. If you traveled more than a day's ride away uh, and you took paper money uh, in exchange for something, you took a real chance that maybe the paper money that you had accepted would not be worth anything. It, it was a, a counterfeiter's uh, paradise with those kinds of things. So uh, private money and paper money, uh, since it couldn't be controlled, uh, had to be gotten out of circulation. And the standard way of doing that was to use taxes. So new taxes were enacted by Congress on private banknotes and by uh, private issue coins and scrip. And it was basically taxed out of circulation. And then its production was eventually prohibited. That was all well and good. We've got new coins, new paper money. Uh, we've got some borrowing going on. But the Union by 1863 is finding that it still isn't raising enough money to pay the cost of prosecuting the war in the South. So the Lincoln administration turns to some Wall Street, not whiz kids, because they weren't kids, but some Wall Street bankers who were very bright. Uh, one of those had already become the Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, uh, a man who uh, had a, a strong history in Liberty Party and, and Republican abolition circles, uh, had been a free soil senator, and uh, had been one of the rivals of Lincoln for the presidential nomination in 1860. He's working with Lincoln in uh, what's been called in a recent book, Lincoln's Team of Rivals, and uh, advises Lincoln on who to pick to head up the cause of union finance. The man they pick is a Wall Street magnate by the name of Jay Cook, uh, who turns out to be a financial genius. And he is the architect of most of the financial actions that are taken by the Union that eventually uh, support the Civil War and finance the Union victory. Very energetic salesman. Uh, in 1865, he sells $850 million worth of bonds alone. Now remember that the entire uh, import tax situation for the country amounts to only $75 million. Uh, he is able to sell $850 million worth of bonds uh, to the to people in the Union and to other investors uh, in 1865 alone. He later on runs into some financial troubles, but that's a story for the future. This is a typical notice that appears in a local paper, in this case the Ontario County Times, published in Canandaigua. Uh, you can find these in any of the Monroe County newspapers of the time. Uh, advertising for uh, a 730 loan, uh, 730 having to do with the interest rate and the uh, length of time that the loan or the bond uh, would be good uh, that was issued by the United States government. They, they did heavy advertising. Uh, they did uh, very heavy, very aggressive marketing. And eventually, they found one really creative and very effective method of marketing. And that was uh, in the National Bank Acts, uh, the first one being 1863, and the second one passed in 1864 to correct uh, some of the things that were provided in the 1863 Act that, that weren't just right. And here is uh, an advertisement for the First National Bank of the City of New York, organized with a capital of $200,000, the directors being Mr. Thompson of Thompson Brothers, George uh, Newell, George F. Baker, and uh, Charles Blondell. Uh, I don't know, do any of those names ring any bells with any of you? Thompson, yeah, as in F.F. F. Thompson, Canandaigua.
Mary Clark Thompson of Sonnenberg. Uh, you know, there's a, just to kind of jump ahead a little bit, there's an old saying, I don't know who said, I tried to check up on it about a year ago, and I, I can't find the origin of it anywhere, but it, it's been repeated often over the years. Uh, in war, some people get killed, and other people make a killing. If you've been to Sonnenberg Gardens, and you've been through the mansion, you know which side of that equation the Thompson family was on. The money that built the Sonnenberg Mansion, the money that built Sonnenberg Gardens, was the money that the Thompsons made in the First National Bank of the City of New York. It was the first national bank to receive a national bank charter in the state of New York, and it was one of the first five, I think, in the entire country. So they got in on the ground floor of all of this. Now, what the National Bank's Bank Act did was, uh, it was a great marketing technique, the National Bank Act provided that if a bank would buy a certain amount of United States bonds, okay, that that bank, under its own name, would be able to issue paper money up to a certain percentage of those bonds, and that paper money issued by the local bank would be guaranteed by the United States government. So it was paper money based on bonds, backed by the United States government, but having no specie, no gold or silver behind it. And it allowed banks to you know, really expand the money supply almost in an unlimited manner. Uh, the, uh, at the same time, there is uh, another bank that is organized uh, in New York, another one of the very early national bank charters, just to give you an idea, First National Bank of the City of New York is still in business. Some of you may do business with it. It's called Citibank. That's, it's changed its name over time. Oh, that, that went on for uh, well into the 20th century. Uh, you can, uh, at least into the 1920s. Yeah, you can find around here. I just bought on eBay because it was all beat up and it didn't cost much. Uh, First National Bank of Fairport, uh, a $1 bill. This thing had been ripped in one place and had scotch tape. It was the kind of thing a coin collector wouldn't want, but it makes a nice historical artifact, and because of its condition, didn't cost much. So it, it fit all the criteria for me. Uh, but yeah, into the 1920s, and there were a number of them in Monroe County that, uh, that, issued, that were organized after the war. The National Bank Act continued. And it still continues. And uh, any of the banks that have the word national bank in them today uh, or have uh, the letters N-A after the bank, you know, Chase Bank, comma, N-A. The N-A stands for National Association. So that's another one of the lasting uh, impacts of the Civil War. So, yeah, the National Bank Act does have a lasting impact uh, there's Mr. Frederick Ferris Thompson and the uh, estate that uh, he and his wife built in 1887, uh, very largely with profits the bank made uh, helping to finance the Civil War. Now, I have to say, you know, to say it that way may imply, I don't want any of you to think that I think that's very sleazy or anything. You know, you, you can't have a party without some finances. You can't have a war without finances. When F.F. F. Thompson died in 1899 in New York City, the New York Times ran a lengthy, uh, more, than a, more than a full column obituary. And one of the things they said about him was that during the Civil War, he did his patriotic duty. The, what, what the Thompsons did in organizing the bank and helping to finance the war, absolutely was one of the things that was needed. But Okay, national bank notes. By far, the largest number of, of paper bills that are issued during the Civil War are national banknotes. Those first banknotes, the various ones, the compound interest notes and the demand notes of 1861 and the rest of them, speaking archivally, they're very difficult to find. You can find, uh, you know, in a place like Metropolitan Monroe County, uh, you can find coin dealers and collectors that have those in their collection. 
Uh, if you wanted to buy one of those on the collector market today, uh, a fair price for a $1 bill uh, issued in the, that first series of greenbacks is several thousand dollars. But there are hundreds of thousands of these national banknotes from the Civil War era that are available. And if you go on something like eBay and you put in as your, you know, put in some search item like, uh, you know, Civil War paper money or something like that, uh, what you almost always will come up with is national banknotes uh, from all over the country. They're, a, they're a, by themselves uh, a very important uh, you know, piece of archival evidence about the war, but they're also a very popular collector's item. You can expand the money supply, you can increase the number of coins, you can increase the, the import taxes, there's things that you can do, but that is still not raising the amount of money that is needed to uh, crush the South and win the victory in the Civil War. So the next step uh, that the U.S. government takes, that Congress takes uh, to prosecute the war is the passage of the Internal Revenue Acts. The first of them is passed in July of 1862 and among other things it uh, imposes excise taxes on liquor, tobacco, playing cards, carriages, yachts, billiard tables, jewelry, patent medicines, and newspaper advertising. And that last one, you know, that might be a separate issue today. That today, you know, we might look at that as a kind of a freedom of speech issue. But when you look at those other things that are on that list, one of the things that comes through loud and clear is that uh, in the imposition of these new taxes, they were by design aimed at the people who had the money. I forgot who it is, but the famous bank robber of the 1920s was asked why he hit certain places and his comment was because that's where the money is. So when you, uh, when you uh, pass one of these laws, uh, if you're really going to gather in some revenue to pay the costs of the war, you've got to tax the people who've got the money. So uh, carriages, yachts, you know, liquor, tobacco, and playing cards you could probably find anywhere, but most of the money is going to come from those other things. Who's got the uh, Act of 1862 also imposed license taxes on almost every profession except the clergy. Uh, put on value-added taxes, inheritance taxes, and taxes on gross receipts of corporations, banks, and insurance companies, and taxes on dividends and interest. We became a, a, a country of taxes starting uh, in 1862. And I'll show you just some examples of that. Uh, here is a, uh, an invoice from the Van Zant brothers, uh, a supplier of... Uh, coffee, spices, and groceries in Rochester, uh, paid by a store in Victor, and evidence of the payment of the excise tax is the tax stamp down here on the bottom. Uh, you uh, wanted to write a check. Uh, you know, if you have a bank account and you write personal checks, which was seen as a, as a very upper middle class thing to do in those days, uh, here is a check. Uh, written against uh, a bank in Geneva, uh, the, uh, national, the Geneva National Bank, which is not the same as the National Bank of Geneva or the Five Star Bank that's out there today. Those are two different organizations. This is the Civil War thing. Personal check, right up here in the corner, a tax stamp. Just, uh, in this case, 10 cents uh, to show that you had, in fact, paid the taxes. Bank draft, you want to get a uh, a, a, a bank check to pay someone. Uh, this is a bank check from the First National Bank of Canandaigua and uh, right here on the check is a, the check itself was for uh, $40, $47 and uh, I guess it's either 40 cents or no cents. They, they're not written quite the same as today and my bad eyes aren't reading that part of it well. But uh, that resulted in a, uh, a tax, uh, internal revenue tax stamp on there of two cents, which doesn't sound like very much to finance a war, but when you think of all of these transactions, all of which are generating two cents here and five cents there, you know, it, it's like the tax revenues that our state is missing now 
that used to be placed on stock transactions and now isn't because of what happened to the stock market, uh, I think most of those stock transaction taxes are about a quarter of a cent. But it, the blizzard of trades that go on on Wall Street takes all those little quarter of a cent taxes and turns them into real money for the state of New York when it, when it does in fact happen. This is uh, a, uh, a, a notice for the, the collection of a bank note, again from Geneva. And uh, it's an example of how uh, tax stamps, in this case five cents, uh, were, were applied to uh, standard banking financial transactions. But just about everything you did that was, had to do with banks or business, uh, if it was over a certain value especially, resulted in the use of a tax stamp. Uh, among other things, there are taxes on professional photographs. This is, uh, on the left there, is uh, the back side of a uh, studio photograph. And there's the tax stamp that you had to pay to have a portrait taken. And uh, on the uh, right side is uh, another larger uh, 50 cent tax stamp that was uh, attached to a, a larger financial transaction of the day. This is uh, one of the things that I'm just passing around here for you to take a look at. So we'll go kind of through that. The uh, first federal income tax graduated tax on people's incomes, per se, is passed in August of 1861. Uh, here is uh, an announcement that appeared in the papers telling the, the people of the area that the income tax uh, was coming and that uh, certain people were going to have to pay it. Uh, if you uh, had an income of $800 or less a year, it was an ungraduated tax of uh, 3%. And, uh, or excuse me, over $800. It was an ungraduated tax. That was uh, the following year turned into a graduated income tax. So uh, if your income was between $600 and $10,000, uh, you paid a 3% tax on your income. If your income was over $10,000, you paid a 5% tax on your income. Exempted businesses worth less than $600 uh, provided for withholdings on the salaries of government workers and withholding on corporate dividends. Uh, so it's, uh, again, the, the taxes that are coming out are being directed at the people who've got the money. I don't know if any of you have dealt with taxes lately, seen those forms, you know, especially with the notice of, you know, a simplified uh, uh, filing and all that. This is as simple as it gets. This is the original income tax form, all four pages of it. So this one happens to be blank. Uh, but it was a much simpler operation. It was aimed at the place where the money was, and it was graduated. And you can see there it gets uh, a little higher, gets up to a 10% tax. Just to give you some sense of how members of Congress and public officials felt about this, this kind of reflects the difference uh, in attitudes today, both on the part of the public and on the part of the representatives that they elect. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact this is a civil war. This isn't a, a war against some terrorists on the other side of the world. This is a war against the people who want to rip apart your own country. And, and they felt uh, very serious about that. So uh, Thaddeus Stevens, Republican presidential leader, uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives for much of the Civil War. Uh, While the rich and thrifty will be obliged to contribute largely from the abundance of their means, no burdens have been imposed on the industrious laborer and mechanic. The food of the poor is untaxed, and no one will be affected by the provisions of this bill whose living depends solely on his manual labor. Okay, so money made by money is going to be taxed heavily. Money made by people who swing a pick and, and a shovel is going to be virtually untaxed in the Civil War uh, income taxes. And there are the original income tax forms. Did everybody have to file, though? I mean, Only if you owed. If you didn't owe anything, you didn't have to file. And the interesting thing about filing is that 
in most cases, you had to physically carry your tax to the tax collector. There'd be an announcement in the paper uh, right here. Uh, all persons having an income over $600 for the year 1864, and all persons having gold or gilt watches, uh, and so forth and so forth, uh, please uh, bring the returns to me at my office the first Monday in May. You had to go to the uh, local internal revenue agent and personally deliver your tax return. No mailing it in. And you certainly didn't want to write a check because that was going to get taxed. So you'd pay a tax on how you paid the tax. Uh, and tax information was public knowledge. Here's a, an article again from the Ontario County at, Times, 1863. Uh, the law provided that uh, the public would know the names of those who paid taxes. They would know the amount of their liability, uh, both personal and corporate. Uh, and by uh, 1864, newspapers were publishing lists of who paid and how much they paid. So you uh, have over here uh, uh, heavy taxpayers. Our enterprising fellow townsmen, the Misters J and A McKechnie, are probably doing a larger business in the way of manufacturing ale than any other firm in western New York. Some idea, my eyes are blurring here, some idea of the magnitude of their operations may be obtained from the fact that during the month of June, they paid a government tax on ale alone in the amount of uh, $761.10. Uh, that is 60 cents a barrel, which we believe is the rate of in the rate of assessment shows their sales for the period named to have reached uh, 1,268 and a half barrels. J and A McKechnie Brewers uh, were uh, a, a regionally well-known brewer of a, a company of beer and ale in Canandaigua. Uh, they stayed in business until 1919 and were put out of business only by prohibition. Their, their uh, building lasted a long time. Uh, no, no particular reason why folks from up this way would necessarily know McKechnie Brewing Company, but it, it did do a very large business. Uh, and uh, you know the, the uh, tax figures were made public and you could check on people and you know it was uh, as other public issues were in later years it was uh, a, a, an opportunity for the public at a very basic la level to make sure that their fellow citizens had done their duty, paid their taxes if they owed them and, and so forth. If, if you knew that someone lived in a grand house and had grand things and you looked at the announcement in the paper and didn't see their name there as a taxpayer, you would immediately want to ask a question. And uh, it, it was a, a very, uh, very basic way of uh, calling people to account. Well, all of this, of course, results in an army of officials. You've got to have agents, collectors, commissioners. Here's an internal revenue notice here, and it names all of the various collectors and deputy collectors for internal revenue. If you're going to have local offices and people have to hand deliver their tax return, they have to deliver it to somebody. So you need people who serve at least on a part-time basis uh, as a government agent. And those are just some of the documents that you can find in local government depositories today that name who those agents were, appoint them to their jobs, and define the areas of their responsibility, and also the information that you can find in the newspapers. Well, I mentioned Antietam. One last area where money needs to be raised and expended. Uh, one area where uh, there's a direct relationship to the raising of money and the expending of money. And that has to do with raising the several hundred thousand soldiers it's going to take to win the Civil War for the North. And uh, what we have to do is to go back to, to taking a look at how... Uh, the, the Union in particular raised its personnel. Very few people, up to the time of the Civil War, of course, the U.S. Army uh, depended entirely on people volunteering. You went out and enlisted in the Army and you were in. But that was a very small army. At, the Civil War required 
uh, a massive expansion in the army. Lincoln's first call for troops was about 75,000. And he had no trouble getting that number of people to volunteer at the time of the first Battle of Bull Run. But that was a disaster for the Union. And after that, there were continual calls. And they got for more men, and they got for longer periods of time. The first call was for 75,000 men to serve for three months. Then it got to be 125,000 men to serve for two years. And then it was 400,000 men to serve for the duration. The total number of men that had to be raised was sent out to the state governors. And the, it was sent out in proportion to the population of the state. So New York State would receive a call for a percentage, fairly large percentage of that number. The states then apportioned it down according to legislative districts. In New York, they recruited according to senatorial districts. State senators were elected from counties. Didn't have the boundary lines that we've had since 1962. So, uh, you know, Monroe County would be a, a, a senatorial district by itself. Uh, Ontario County and Wayne County together were another senatorial district. Uh, and the, the, the proportion of the state's quota, depending on the population, was then appointed out to the senatorial districts. The deal was, you've got a certain amount of time to raise this number of men that is apportioned to your senatorial district. If you don't raise the number of men that's required, we'll have a draft. And that was the big threat. So after that, there's a certain amount of patriotism involved. Uh, there's also a certain amount of, of uh, commotion within the community to hurry up and, uh, and, and raise enough people to fill the quota. Particularly if you didn't want your son to go, then you needed to make sure somebody else's son did for that. But yeah. that's how it operated. After the Battle of Antietam, it gets very difficult to raise people. You know, people like uh, Matthew Brady are out there showing pictures of what's happening. So it takes money, bounties, and uh, New York counties began to fund bounties as early as 1862. Uh, here is a, an advertisement from a Canandaigua paper, and again, you can find them in all the papers around the area here. Volunteer bounty bonds for sale, uh, people giving county governments the money so that the county government can float the bonds needed to pay the bounties to encourage county residents to enlist in the Union Army to go fight the Civil War. This is one of those examples of where I tell you that much of the cost of the war was financed at the local level, unlike today. On the left there is the Ontario County Bounty Bond Book uh, that lists by name all of the people that paid for bounty bonds during the Civil War, how much they paid, what the interest rate was in the time, and so forth. Wayne County, town of Galen, uh, shows you an example of uh, why the bounties were needed to ensure that people would enlist. If a draft was resorted to, the draft had more holes than Swiss cheese. And uh, you can see... Uh, in the end there, in, in the July 1863 draft, the first draft held in Wayne County, town of Galand, uh, they had judged that there were 455 men eligible for the draft. They called up 137 of them, and only 25 of that number actually ended up being called into the service. Of the rest of them, uh, you, know, you could pay a $300 commutation fee. That raised money, but didn't supply, didn't supply anybody to the Army. Uh, 34 were physically disabled. They allowed local physicians to uh, declare uh, physical disability. I'll have to go back and get it because I, I love it. Editorial run in, the, in what's now the Daily Messenger in Canandaigua after the 1863 draft in Ontario County. And the editor of the Messenger points out that uh, he's feeling a little uh, uneasy about the fact that the entire Canandaigua Fire Department was found physically disabled for the draft. He's really not sure how to deal with that. It's like me. A week and a half ago, uh, they declared that I could go back to driving, and my ophthalmologist says, 
you know there are a lot of one-eyed drivers out there. I'm not really sure that that makes me feel terribly comfortable. You only have to have vision correctable to 2040, and you only need one eye. And I'm thinking, eee. <laughs> Little, uh, little nervous about that one, even though I have to be one of them now. There was a provision in the draft law, and it went back to the, to the various militia acts that had been uh, passed uh, in the years since the 1790s, that um, it was possible, if you didn't want to serve, that you could hire a substitute. And that's what, uh, you know, some people did it because it was the appropriate thing to do. Abraham Lincoln, who was well over age, and as President of the United States, certainly didn't need to be in the Army, per se. He was Commander-in-Chief of the Army. Hired a substitute, because it was the thing to do. F.F. Uh, F. Thompson, lots of people did it. You, for $300, you could be excused, and you could hire a substitute. And it wasn't even your job to find the substitute. You just simply put up the $300. As the war got tougher, it got tougher to find substitutes. But then there were a class of people who would willingly get involved in that uh, because they wanted to collect the bounty that they could then get. And in, in a day and age when there's no fingerprints, no photographs, no mass communications, uh, it became possible for creative people to do all sorts of shenanigans. But the bottom line on the substitute thing was it, it was seen uh, in, the, in the end as being very futile because there were lots of people who could come up with the $300 for a substitute, but if you couldn't actually get the substitute, then uh, you, know, you can't win the war by throwing dollar bills at the enemy. You've got to have somebody there. Governments themselves became creative. It was Monroe County that was ultimately responsible for coming up with its quota of men. So if you've got the money for substitutes, uh, if you uh, want to convince people to enlist, uh, maybe you have to think outside the box. Every county in this area, among other things, uh, went south. Uh, after the Union Army took New Orleans and the Mississippi River was in Union hands, uh, you started to have large numbers of freed slaves who went to the Union armies, went to get past the Union lines, uh, to escape slavery. And uh, so commissioners from this area would go to South Carolina, they would go to Louisiana, they would go to other cities and counties to find people who were willing to enlist against, say, the Monroe County quota or the Ontario County quota, which is why if you do local history research and you look at Civil War soldier lists, you frequently come across names of people you just don't recognize. You know, my uh, town of Victor, where I worked for a long time, uh, in, in all of their local histories in the Civil War, uh, one of the people that they proudly list is Warren Carmen. Uh, Warren Carmen received the Medal of Honor in 1864. That's why they're so proud of him. Warren Carmen never set foot in the town of Victor. He was born and raised in Avon, and he enlisted against an Ontario County quota. You know, people, they bought him like... Uh, you know, uh, grain futures or, uh, you know, the, the trading of environmental credits or something. So if, if your town had more enlistees than it needed, then you could trade your enlistees to some other town that didn't have enough to meet their quotas. So you have people spread around all over. Warren Carmen ended up after the war coming to Rochester and, and uh, died in the early 20th century. But he lived out most of his adult life in Rochester, and there's plenty of of uh, documentary evidence of his life, but the town of Victor claims him, and only because he ended up on their, on their quota list. Uh, bounty resolutions passed by each county, those are the ones that were uh, listed. Uh, and as I say, there were, uh, there were people who thought creatively, in the bad sense, uh, about how to get their hands on more bounty money when it was tough to track down uh, people who had committed crimes. And uh, in some cases, uh, people who would enlist to get a bounty and then desert uh, were simply caught and uh, paraded around the community, often with a sign, uh, imprisoned for a short time. Uh, and then, uh, you know, hum public humiliation was a good part of the punishment. 
On the other hand, uh, there were those who were uh, more serious about it. And if you had accepted a bounty for, uh, to replenish a unit that had been in combat for a while, uh, and then you deserted uh, your fellow soldiers who may have endured some hard marching and hard fighting took a, a much more uh, uh, jaded look at your actions and the Union Army began to have executions of people who had uh, jumped bounties, collected bounties. And, you know, there, there are no local police departments. Uh, there is telegraph, but there's no way to, to send images long distance. Very little way to, to catch up to anybody who uh, commits various kinds of frauds in the 19th century. So bounty jumping was fairly easy to do, but if you got caught, the penalty became increasingly serious in the course of the Civil War, and the public execution of uh, bounty jumpers uh, became very common in 1864. Basically, they would bring the entire regiment out, they would form a U, the, the uh, condemned would be forced to uh, dig their own grave, sit on their coffin, and then they would be publicly shot by a firing squad, and, and that would serve, uh, again, as a public humiliation to them, but as a an object lesson and a warning to anyone else. This is a, an illustration from Harper's Weekly, one of the more popular national newspapers. Bounties funded substitutes. A lot of bounty money went into the funding of substitutes, and there are in every county today lists of the people who served as substitutes and who were funded by bounties. Uh, bounties also served to raise the money for recruiting fees. We don't often think about that, but there were people who served as agents uh, in the same way that someone might serve as an agent today to uh, uh, line up a, you know, a sports star for a dinner or get a, an actress a better contract. And those fees for recruiting, for those that were very good at that in particular, uh, had to be paid, and it was the bounty money that paid that. Each of the counties sold uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to their own residents and anybody else who would buy the bounty bonds. There is a, an example of an Essex County bond. Uh, this is an example of a Monroe County bond. And uh, there's, a, there's actually a picture of that on the last page of the uh, reading list that I provided here. There's a Genesee County bond. Yeah, there, there was no uniform design to these uh, county bonds that were issued. There's your Monroe County bond. There's a Bucks County bond from Bucks County, Pennsylvania for $300. Mention the financial impact of the war on towns. Local property taxes were what were used to raise the town's expenses for the support of soldiers and soldiers' families. And you can see here the town of East Bloomfield in Ontario County, $948 uh, being raised, uh, $624 for relief, $256 for uh, roads and highways, and uh, $300 here for uh, yeah, contingent expenses of some kind there. But, uh, you know, you can, you can get an idea. The numbers are all ridiculously small compared to what a township has to pay today for things. But the, the point is that what was paid uh, for the support of soldiers' families and for the support of the soldiers from the towns that went out compared to all the other things that towns did was huge. And very often it was as much or more than the total other expenses that the towns incurred. It was a, as much a bottom-up war as it was from the top down. The, the towns using property tax money to support the soldiers' families, the counties floating bonds to support the enlistment process, the state floating bonds and the federal government floating bonds and expanding the money supply to pay for all the things that were necessary. There's a recap for Ontario County. I, I know we're getting late, so I'll get through this here. Uh, and a recap published in the paper of the uh, various amounts that Ontario County paid as an example. After the war, New York State stepped up and took over and funded all of the county bonds. So in the end, 
the counties were made whole by the state. And the state entered into quite a period of indebtedness uh, for the Civil War in the years after the war was over. And there's a, a state bond. There's another one from uh, 1877, some $27 million to pay bond debt. State coupon bonds advertised. It was considered a very good and safe investment guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the uh, state, uh, state of New York in our case. Uh, and again, there were agents. Charles Richardson, claim agent, advertising uh, in Canandaigua that he would help uh, people who had uh, claims against the state and the county for money due under various bounty and uh, acts and, and uh, bond arrangements. Richardson himself was a very gallant soldier in the Civil War, uh, severely wounded at Gettysburg in 1863, and a man with a very distinguished record became the county treasurer and eventually the surrogate judge of Ontario County. Guy had a very, uh, very good resume for this, but became the agent. And this is just a, an example of uh, you know, what in, ensues in the decades after the war. Now, mentioned about ensuring the victory. Uh, after the victory in 1865, after this enormous effort to raise the money on the part of the Union, uh, the South is defeated, the slaves are freed, uh, the, the Confederate government is put out of business, and for a brief period of time, the, the officers of the Confederacy are disfranchised. Uh, nobody actually, well, I won't say nobody, there were a very, very few people who paid a heavy penalty for the support of the Confederacy. The commanding officer of the Andersonville prison camp, for example, was hanged uh, shortly after the war. But Jefferson Davis, the president uh, of the Confederacy, spent two years in custody and was then released. Robert E. Lee, the commanding general, uh, was released immediately on his own parole and went off to be a college president. Uh, but there was a sense that uh, the victory should be secured. And the way it was secured was in part through the 14th Amendment. We think of the 14th Amendment as guaranteeing citizenship, but we forget there's another part. There's a, a poison pill for the Confederacy uh, buried in the 14th Amendment. And that is uh, the fourth clause. Debts incurred in aid of rebellion are void. The validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services and suppressing the insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. But neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of the insurrection. So... Uh, these Confederate bonds that were never entirely paid off, none of the Confederate states or anybody else uh, can ever legally say, you know, we're going to make good on these. Uh, it, there, there was a, a, a punishment, a financial punishment, that was actually worse than any other punishment for the care of the veterans. The VA hospital in Bath began as the New York State Soldiers and Sailors Hospital, uh, established specifically to aid soldiers from the uh, Union forces in the war. There's the state monument that went up on the battlefield at Gettysburg. When it was dedicated, uh, the uh, state of New York uh, created a special medal for soldiers who had fought at Gettysburg and actually paid their train fares to go back to Gettysburg to be present at the dedication of the state monument. And of course, all that cost money and was all part of the money that had to be raised. There's a, a check from the treasurer of Ontario County. Uh, this is uh, 1895, long 30 years after the war is over, uh, showing an expenditure of the, of the county government for the support of the Grand Army of the Republic Post down in Naples. So. Uh, We've uh, gone a little uh, longer than we probably should have. Uh, appreciate your attention, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Does anybody have any questions? Right now we have a civil war going on in Afghanistan. Right. 
Did we have any, during, this, during our Civil War, any foreign supply of money? Uh, not gift money like, like we're doing for Afghanistan, but uh, on the Union side, we did a lot of war business with European countries. Uh, we didn't do as much, however, as the Confederacy did. The Confederacy had no effective armories. They had very little in the way of supplies. Uh, they did have a commercial commodity, at least at the start, that European countries are very interested in. So France and Britain in particular uh, thought long and hard about intervening in the war on the side of the Confederacy. Uh, in the end, uh, they did not. But they, you know, they, uh, they built and supplied for the Confederacy a number of commerce raiders, ships, uh, the, the most famous of which was the, the Alabama uh, that was loose on the oceans. And depending on which side you were on was either a, a, you know, a gallant ship or a pirate. Uh, and uh, raided uh, commerce on the high seas for the benefit of the Confederacy. But no money, there was, there was foreign money that came in an investment. You know, the expansion of factories in the North uh, resulted in a lot of European money being invested in the United States. You know, it was a good deal to buy stock in any number of U.S. companies. Yeah, that's an investment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they wanted uh, the other company, uh, England and France wanted cotton yes. right, from the South. Absolutely. So yep. that helped the South. Uh, but once they realized that that was kind of a dead issue, uh, and they found another source of cotton, particularly in Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yes? Do we know who President Lincoln's substitute uh, was? I believe that it is known. I don't know it. I know it happened. I remember reading about it, but I have to tell you, I, I don't know who it was, I, it probably is not too hard to find out. I don't know, to be honest with you. Uh, it was something that was done not because he had to, but because it was uh, the appropriate thing to do. It was a patriotic thing to do. Yes? All these items that you have passed around, are those all that you got on eBay? Or did you get... No, I, uh, I, I actually own some of these. The, uh, the Monroe County bond I got on eBay. Uh, much of the rest of this is on loan to me by the Department of Records and Archives from Ontario County. Uh, these are all documents that were filed uh, for various purposes with the Ontario County Clerk. And so they're, uh, they're in here. And you know, I, I do have to say for, uh, oh, I bought, I bought this years ago. I, I always wanted to own, they're a big collector item. I always wanted to own a Confederate bond. Now I have one. <laughs> um, the, uh, and I, I, I do have to say, if you're going to, you know, to get back to the archiving part of this, uh, having something in cardboard is just about the worst thing that you can do for archival documents because cardboard is loaded with sulfuric acid. And if you keep a document in there for any length of time, the acid will migrate to the documents. But the reason I get away with it for short periods of time is the fact that you'll notice all these things, these are not laminated, they're what's called encapsulating. The, the actual, there's nothing actually stuck to the document there inside this acid-free encapsulation material. Uh, and at any time we want to get them out, we just slice it open and the document pulls right out. So it's it's uh, buffered from or protected from the normally bad effects of cardboard. However, when I get home, I'll get it out of the cardboard. But I just thought I'd better mention that in case there's somebody here that knows about cardboard and preservation and, uh, and acid. So it's uh, sort of a case of uh, you know, doing what I tell other people not to do, but it isn't really because I've encapsulated all the documents. Well, again, thank you very much. It's